Hey, welcome back to Locad TV. Third party logistics, or free PLs, are a way of a company externalizing their warehousing or distribution. Free PLs is a real growing industry and it's expected to meet a trillion dollars by 2025. Whenever you order an item off of Amazon or eBay, a lot of the time you expect it to be delivered by a merchant, but in a lot of the cases, it's actually a free PL that delivers it. Today, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by Jing Zhang Zhu, who's come from uh, Winit to talk to us today a little bit about free PLs. So perhaps as a sort of a starter, you could just sort of introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about yourself. Yeah, so um, I, gu I guess I I've had a kind of strange career to end up uh, in my position now. Um, I actually graduated uh, in computer science uh, from a university in the United States. Um, and after that, I worked at Microsoft for 10 years. Um, some of that, most of that in, in the United States and some of that in China. Um, and I, I was basically a, a developer. I started writing code on Internet Explorer. I worked on uh, Exchange, um, uh, text-to-speech systems, I worked on Windows, um, I worked on uh, a whole bunch of different products. Um, but I ended up saying, hey, you know, maybe I should try doing something else other than just pure software development. And I ended up, when I left Microsoft, I joined a company called uh, Light in the Box. Now, Light in the Box was, uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, it's kind of past its heyday, but it, it was a basically an e-commerce company with its own website that was based out of China. It was one of the first s companies to do that, uh, you know, uh, in, in the last 10 years. Uh, it was able to uh, go public, actually, on the, uh, I think the, it was the NYSE um, um, uh, about five to six years ago. Um, and what it did was it, it went to all the manufacturers uh, in China that were, you know, churning out all the products that Western countries were buying and it sold them directly to Western consumers on its website. Um, and it, it was able to grow to $20 million in sales in its first three years and it was able to grow to $120 million, uh, $200 million in, in the n next two, two to three years. So it's phenomenal growth, right? And I was the uh, vice president of engineering um, at that company. I helped them build their technology systems, uh, their sort of outward facing websites, their search engine optimization, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I was sort of as part of a very fast growing uh, cross border e tailer. Um, I, was, I was right in the thick of it. Uh, I ended up leaving that company and I ended up working uh, in, uh, in China's largest social network for uh, you know, about six months. Uh, I, it was a completely different experience for me. I, I owned the uh, ad network for Weibo, uh, which was uh, basically you know, for our audiences here, China's version of Facebook and Twitter combined. Um, so uh, I did that. It wasn't. I decided it wasn't quite for me. So uh, in 2012, I helped co-found uh, Winit, uh, which is you know, the, the company I'm still uh, still at. And we'll okay. Talk about today. Great. So it sounds like you've had a really sort of high-tech kind of background, especially at places like Microsoft. Um, free PLs are typically an industry that people don't think of as being quite so high-tech. A bit more of a low-tech kind of background. Um, but that's not the approach that Win it takes, is it? So perhaps you could just sort of tell us a bit more about that approach. Yeah, I, I think you know before we talk about Win it, I think I, I want to just uh, you know in why I decided to you know with our co-founders decide to found this company, right? Mm -hmm. And why I think it was a very uh, good decision. Uh, when we found the company, I, I think you know I just came out of both uh, you know a uh, China's largest social networking company and sort of the first company that was really successful in cross-border e-commerce uh, coming out of China. And, and I, I think, you know, I just I observed, I think, three trends that I think are super, super important and that are impacting 
cross-border trade in a significant way. Right? The, the first one was the fact that if you look at the traditional cross-border supply chain and who's, you know, 20 years ago, who controls the supply chain, right? Now, whoever has the inventory, whoever is facing the customers controls the supply chain. So 20 years ago, you just got e-commerce just, just beginning to sprout out, right? So the people that control the supply chain are, uh, you know, the large retail stores that have these storefronts that your average consumer is going into and out of every day to make their purchases, right? And they've got large, very sophisticated supply chain management departments that, you know, decides who to order from, uh, how much to, to pay, how much inventory to stock, um, all the flow, all the logistic flow between multiple locations and facilities, right? So that, that's the traditional sense, right? But what we have now is, you know, you've got, you've got the internet, which has been around for a while. You've got Amazon, you've got eBay, you've got, you know, every other month you've got a new e-commerce platform popping up that, you know, really gets popular really quickly as well. So you've got all of these, uh, these channels where now uh, the people who are actually manufacturing the products are getting closer and closer to the consumer, right? And as they're getting closer to closer to the consumer, the, the, the control of the sh supply chain is, is shifting uh, you know, backwards. They're, they're shifting more and more to, okay, the, I mean, this is not by any means a done deal, right? You've still got all your local storefronts that, that, that have their own management control of the supply chain, but we're seeing more and more of the actual manufacturers of the products. They've got a direct customer facing relationship. So they've got, they're controlling more and more of the supply chain uh, from when that finished consumer product uh, it, it is produced to it are to all the way to delivering to the hands of the consumer. So, so that's the first sort of paradigm shift that that we saw uh, back uh, in 2012 when we founded Winit. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, which is actually correlated with the first trend, is that uh, you know the the merchant that is uh, the small and medium-sized merchant. It's, it's becoming more and more viable for them to uh, do business online and to sort of have a long-term sustainable uh, business that they can you know, make money and grow every month, every year. Um, you know, um, I think I, I saw some data that sort of Amazon's marketplace you know, versus, you know, the, the stuff Amazon sells by themselves. Uh, the, the marketplace sales actually are exceeding the sales of in the stuff Amazon sells uh, you know, that the, the they supply directly yeah. by themselves. So everybody on that marketplace is basically uh, a seller, right? Some of them may be just somebody sitting at home in front of a computer who's you know, talking to the uh, manufacturers and, 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 and then directly having that account on, on Amazon or on eBay uh, that's, 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 that's making the sales, right? So, so there's literally tens and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of these individual merchants online having a business. Right, and you can actually take a bunch of online courses on YouTube to, to if you want to start one. Right, some of them not very legitimate, but but uh, a good portion are. Yeah. yeah, perhaps this is a good point for Johannes to dive in. Uh, what's your sort of take on these changes in the in the industry? Indeed, uh, the fact that you can decentralize it means also that you can have an army of 
of, uh, of, of specialists that knows some classes of products very, very well and they know how to market it, to present it, to make them appealing and even to provide the correct description and, and uh, uh, an explanation online, etc. So it's instead of having one company that expects to have like a gigantic catalog done right, you can have a, a, a market of sellers who that, that are specialists and that do very, very well uh, a few hundreds of products. And I think that's where we, we get in touch with, with, uh, with Winit, is that those people, they cannot afford large scale infrastructure. So they need 3PL to basically abstract away this, um, this part of the business because they cannot even, and they, don't, they are not even interested in setting up their own uh, storage facility, for example. That's, uh, that's something they want to kind of distribute that a bit, a bit I would say, like in the cloud. You want to have like a, an abstraction layer that just takes care of your warehousing needs anywhere in the world and that takes care of your, uh, of your shipments and fulfillment anywhere in the world. And I, I believe that's pretty much where the, the added value of, of Winit lies to deliver this sort of value um, even for, I would say, small or very small companies. Yeah, I mean, we don't even call ourselves a 3PL in the traditional sense, right? And what we do is we allow uh, e-commerce uh, merchants, uh, especially small and medium ones, to focus on the thing that they should be focusing on, and that's their, their, that's their core competency, which is selling, which is finding the, finding the right products, sourcing them, finding the, the customers, and selling to those customers, and providing a uh, very, very good service to those customers, making those customers happy with respect to the products they sell, right? Now, in that, while they're doing that, they shouldn't be worrying about if, you know, uh, how much or how they're going to s get the products into the customer's hands in the right times. They shouldn't be worrying about how to, uh, you know, c calling up customs to figure out, you know, why it's their, their, their skew has been stuck there in for days and days, right? They shouldn't be worrying about how to get that, uh, that product onto a container and, it, and, and get it to the country where they want it to be in the fastest way, right? Those things are not things that, that's not uh, a seller's comp core competency, right? They sh we, we provide very standardized, stable and transparent service at very effective prices to those sellers. So those sellers themselves, they can focus on the thing that, things that they're best, best at. And, and when you say um, uh, to focus, you mean I, I would say I would even see Winit as as an app in a way, you know, an app that is that has APIs. I saw that you have APIs, you know, both. I mean, you you leverage the APIs of the marketplaces of the of eBay, for example, yeah. and but you also Winit also expose its own API so that it can be further integrated in in. Um, uh, and, and further operated by, by the merchants, plugging with their own apps on their side. So in the end, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting because the, the sort of things that I see from Winit is something that is really designed for, I would say, an IT mashup where the merchant can connect, you know, the marketplace, its own fulfillment app, maybe its accounting app, and, and just plug it all together, a, a full online mashup that basically delivers I would say complete automation, except that I would say the, the, the interesting part of Winit is that it's, it's not just software, it's, it's real good and real shipments that are happening underneath. Yeah, I mean, we're, I guess we could call us an <laughs> app, but we're an app that lets you access uh, 70 to 80 of the world's best uh, carriers directly online. So you, you don't need to sign contracts, you don't need to sort of, uh, you know, create relationships you don't need to call them to pick get pick up your inventory uh, you just point and click and you have access to all of our contracts um, and then you can use uh, services right but that that's just part of it right uh, everything in the process of selling and and shipping and managing your inventory you can do with us online right so we have customers that literally never has to touch uh, a cardboard box that has their products in it. They, 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 they tell us to pick it up from China, uh, put it on a boat, 
uh, and then their inventory is available in the warehouse. And then when they get an order, uh, you know, sometimes the order is automa automated, so they don't even, it, it just, our warehouse sends it out and they don't have to actually uh, physically manage the inventory at all. And it's all virtual. So let's talk about some of those challenges that you face then. A lot of the time, e-commerce is kind of being expected more and more. The customers are expecting more. Yeah. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of next day delivery and things like that, how are you sort of fulfilling these sort of uh, high demand from sort of customers? Well, we work uh, very, very deeply and in, in an integrated way with our partners and our vendors. So, uh, you know, for example, uh, we would work with Royal Mail uh, in the UK uh, and we have, uh, we work uh, at the sales level, uh, the operations level and at the finance level with, with Royal Mail. And one initiative we just did last year is, you know, we work together uh, with Royal Mail to inject directly into uh, their their central hub uh, in the uh, Midlands, so that uh, basically the it, it, it doesn't go through uh, another part of their network and causes delays and etc. And you know we we are able to accelerate and and make sure our products gets delivered uh, on time, uh, uh, very very nearly a hundred percent of the time. So what sort yeah. of technological challenges are you sort of facing by ensuring that that's going to happen? Well, um, you know, so this is uh, the other part of our strategy, which is, you know, we think of ourselves as a technology-based uh, lo logistics and supply chain company, right? So we don't think of us as a, a shipping company or a fulfillment company. We're, we're, we think of us as, you know, you know, technology is our core. Um, we have over 100 people working writing code, testing that code, making sure it works, and designing uh, different supply chain and logistics services uh, to, m to make sure to support our uh, entire suite um, of, of uh, products and services. So, so w we think that's our core, right? So we have, uh, and we look at each uh, service or each segment in the supply chain, and we think about, you know, how do we automate how do we integrate and how do we um, sort of look at very, very individual details of that service to make it better, to make it more reliable, to make it faster, more transparent for our customers. So Johannes, where do you see sort of the biggest area for improvement kind of lying? The, the press are going mad about autonomous vehicles, but where do you see sort of the biggest area for improvement for free PLs? Um, I mean, without being an absolute expert in, in FreePL, what I see is, um, is uh, paying attention to, uh, to the details so that uh, integrations is, is a game that is very subtle so that you, you have all the information that flows without losing any, any granulating in terms of detail if something goes wrong, if something there is a delay so that you have the transparency in exactly why so that you can, dis you can basically um, you know, walk back everything that happens so that you can diagnose this sort of uh, any kind of delays that happen uh, the, and diagnose the root cause. So that, that requires, I would say, more than just an integration that works. It's an integration that gives you, uh, uh, an, I would say, an incredibly granular level of information on the, uh, on the execution. Um, and also to cope with all the diversity that you have because you have many carriers, many countries, many situations, many, many, many systems that requires, I would say, it's a bit a, a tour de force in terms of, of engineering to be able to integrate that many systems without having your own system that looks like a monster. You know, uh, because you need to, com to keep the complexity in check so that in terms of, of, of code, your own solution that is kind of touching so many partners do not end up being like, uh, um, I would say, uh, a massive amount of spaghetti code where everything is touching everything and where it's, it becomes very difficult to improve the quality or the productivity of the people who are working on it. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about that diversity. FreePL has got to deal with such a wide different range of products. You're dealing with products that are very big and also very small. How do you deal with that diversity? How are you automating all of those processes? 
Well, it's certainly not simple. <laughs> but we make it, our goal is to make it simple for our customers. So our customers don't see that. They just, they, they, they hand off their inventory to us, it, their products to us, and you know, we, they, they see their, it's on time, uh, that it's visible, it's, and they, they see it's accurate, right? But internally, we have uh, massive amounts of, uh, of planning, of doing uh, predictive analysis, um, of uh, just you know being able to uh, use different types of warehouse automation and technology uh, in order to so that we can manage the different types of products differently, and then so we can you know then then our and then controlling our costs so we then we can pass that along to our customers. Okay. And Johannes, how do you see sort of like an added bit of intelligence being, being added here? What sort of technology can we use to add te intelligence to these supply chains? Yeah, I mean, the, the very traditional 3PL had no intelligence whatsoever. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically they are just taking orders. The client say, I want this to be stocked here. I stock it here. I want to move it somewhere else. I, I move it somewhere else. But then I, 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 I would say, there is zero intelligence, you're just taking orders and executing. That's a, your very traditional, I would say, 3PL. And um, I think the, probably the, the future is, uh, the, is a situation where the 3PL is actually leveraging um, knowledge that you don't have to execute better. Because uh, the 3PL is operating tons of customers behind you. So, so actually, they know, I would say, the, the, the patterns of what is flowing where, uh, what is the carriers that are most efficient for this type of goods or for this type of patents, etc. So, so you have tons of information where being a simple merchant, you do not have access to this information, not in a way that is, I would say, statistically relevant, just because you're not selling enough in, any, in every country, every situation, every type of products, etc. And so a free PL can basically leverage, uh, I would say, all the information that it collects uh, through its platform to add uh, intelligence in, for example, where to stock the products, when, um, uh, how, I would say, how to organize internally in the warehouses, the, the, the storage of the products so that things are, can be accessed with very high productivity. You see, um, you, you have different type of storage for between um, fast, um, fast moving goods where you need shelves that are easily accessible, typically where you, you have everything that is in a bin, one product, one bin, and everything is like randomized in the warehouse versus uh, the storage where you have uh, one bin and it's one type of product and you can have many units in the same. So different type of, of storage layouts can um, uh, can optimize the access for different uh, different sort of I would say of of um, of, uh, of turnover. Yeah, I just want to add yes. a little bit to that because uh, you know like the word three PL. Yeah. It's third party logistics, right? So it's implied that there's a third party managing some other parties. That's why it's called three PL, right? So we look at you know, what are those parties, right? So the, the parties that we manage, we manage. Uh, we, we manage pickup. So we have, you know, let's say you're, you got a, you're, you're manufacturing in China, right? So we got to, you got to take that and take that product to the port. So that's a pickup, right? So that's a party we manage. Then we manage uh, export, right? So, uh, so you got to, you, you got to tell China customs, you know, what's in here. Uh, it's guaranteed it's legit and we manage that, right? Then we manage, you know, ocean freight or air freight, right? So everybody knows, should know what that is. We, we manage import, right? Import is a lot harder than export. Usually you're exporting out of the country. That country likes it, so it's not a big deal. for. When you're importing into a country, uh, maybe, you know, you got to pay tariffs. Maybe they, they don't want that stuff in there. Things or get more entertaining. Uh, we'll things get a lot more <laughs> entertaining, right? And then we manage the warehousing. And lastly, but maybe super importantly, is we manage all the carriers, right? So those are all the parties uh, we manage, right? So I think if you talk about, but if you, I think traditionally all those, all those parties have been managed on, through one-on-one uh, -on -one types of relationships, uh, but, but there's a huge opportunity to leverage, I think, data, right? To take 
to leverage data, to use the data to be more predictable so that you can uh, stop a problem before the problem actually happens, right? So you can say, oh, you know, that particular party is going to have problem with this particular situation. Maybe we should change it or we should go with somebody else. Or you can say, oh, you know, for this type of a package, I don't want to use this carrier because of the historical data. Uh, and then I, the most optimi optimized one is over here. And that's something you definitely agree with, Johannes, right? Uh, absolutely. And I think here, the, 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 the 3PL of the future definitely has access to a lot more information than one individual merchant, just because you, um, you, you, you concentrate all your observations. Yeah. So that's something that would just not be accessible to an individual merchant. And, uh, and there, with the proper technology, obviously, that's a, that's a lot of things uh, to, to do. Uh, the this data can be actually, um, I would say, utilized yeah. for, to yeah. optimize those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, but you know, you're looking at traditional machine learning techniques, and we have deep learning now with you know in the artificial intelligence uh, and and some higher uh, learning techniques that are sort of making allowing us to make sense of that data much, much more uh, coherently, comprehensively, and intelligently, right? So I think that's, that's a huge opportunity there. Okay, and we talk about data, you spoke about a bit about opportunities. If yeah. We talk about the future for Winit. Can you see, uh, envisage a day when Winit is just one day a software company? Because what you're dealing with now in terms of everything you're programming, all of that side of work, could you see a day when it's just software? Well, I, I don't. I don't think that's that's <laughs> our eventual goal, right? So, uh, but I, w I mean, we don't preclude it. Uh, I think we have we're, we're software, we're uh, we're software that helps us with this and this this idea of aggregated management, right? So, if what we do is we take look at okay the whole cro cross border. Uh, e-commerce supply chain and say, okay, we want to manage each piece of that supply chain, put it together as a solution for our customers who are these, you know, uh, sellers online. And we do whatever it takes to make that possible. Now, software is an absolute foundation of that because otherwise you won't be able to scale. You, you know, you won't be able to even, you know, just get things done. Uh, but at the, at the same time, uh, our other core competencies are, you know, when our day-to-day -day operations and making sure that's high quality, that's transparent, and our partnerships with uh, everybody alongside that service chain, right? So maybe it's custom officials in Germany, right? Maybe it's uh, that relationship with uh, DHL, maybe it's uh, you know the 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 air freight forwarder industry. Uh, with all of those partnerships, we want to be we want to make sure that uh, we know how they operate. We know uh, what's going to happen before they actually happen. And it sounds like there's a place there for you, Johannes. Yes, I mean, uh, it's definitely exciting to see this sort of, I would say, new wave of actors in supply chain like Winit, who take, I would say, uh, a tech-driven approach or tech-powered approach to superior execution. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I would say, the, the old school, I would say, supply chain approach is superior leadership to deliver super execution. Obviously, having a better leadership is, is, is always good. Uh, but uh, I think that's a bit uh, the, the, the Amazon lesson, uh, kind of, is that it's not only takes, it also, um, especially with supply chain, which is like a world of details. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally millions of operations. If you want to have super high quality of execution, it takes very high level of automations. Uh, and uh, and then it, it ultimately it, it it relies nowadays on a lot of software. So basically, those I would say those companies of the future and Winit I think it's a very very good example are um, companies that want to achieve excellen uh, excellency in their operations because that's what the customers see ultimately. But uh, the recipe 
is, uh, is that there is a lot of software tech involved, which means that there is a lot of, I would say, quality recipes that you could see in software companies, such as uh, probably a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of testing, you have your own software, so you, you probably have your own development methodology. You can probably, s when you want to develop a new technique, you can basically simulate how it will perform yeah. against your historical data. I mean, these sort, sort of things that are just, that do not exist even, I would say, in traditional free PL, where um, if they want to transition to a new system, that would just be about picking, an, uh, I would say, uh, an ERP or a WMS versus another, it, it doesn't go into the detail of actually engineering something that is provably superior because you have the data and you can even tune the way the software itself is designed to with your own metrics to make sure that it's really, really aligned with what the customers are expecting extra. It's, it's, it's kind of a dis different mindset. I mean, the, the end game remains the, um, uh, let's, I, I know it's, it's a bit vague, vague but uh, supply chain excellency, we would say, but the way it's actually delivered is quite different. And I, I suspect that in terms of taste, in terms of, uh, in, in the company, it is also a, 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 at the headquarters of Winit, if you have like 100 developers, it means that you have a lot of engineers. I mean, you are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, chief, chief strategic well. officer, and you, you've done, you have done, you went to the Ivy League. I mean, it's it's typically, I would say, relatively brain heavy with with teams that have excellent engineering uh, skills. Uh, it's I mean, it it feels a bit like a, a high tech company if mm. you look at the people who operate, as opposed to have, I would say, a very traditional supply chain company where. You have people that started as um, as doing man handling in a warehouse that were good team leader and that finally you know b uh, went to the top of the company. It's 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 different profile. It's more like engineers who think about the the solution that engineers the solution, and uh, ideally by listening very carefully with, to with the client so that the solution is very very aligned. But uh, it's a it's a different way of, of I would say doing things it's for us. At Locad, it's uh, it's exciting times because it's uh, it really go supplements our own vision about quantitative supply chain. It's uh, uh, there is a lot of affinity in doing that. Nice. And Jing Zhang, we'll leave the the last word up to you. If you had one bit of advice for a European e-commerce looking to source from Asia, what would it be? Yeah, I, I would say uh, you know I think the the world is changing, and it's changing uh, quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm specifically talking about the cross-border supply chain, right? So, I, and it, it changes almost, you know, uh, daily or, or even, y but, but there's definitely, you know, something happening, major happening every year, right? Uh, I would say my advice would be keep your eye out and don't be locked to your existing mode uh, of, of, of trading, of, of doing your business, right? Keep your uh, eye out for new opportunities uh, and new, new competition, right? So, for example, one of the things that we're helping enable is, you know, we, we, we have a, a good, very deep connection with the factories in China, right? So we're, we're, we're trying out this mode where the factories themselves put their inventory in European warehouses. So as a, as a European merchant, uh, you don't have to like, you know, do what you were doing before, take, buy a whole container and, 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 and sell it and have your cash locked into that inventory. The factory ships the inventory here. It's owned by the factory. And then we have an online marketplace or platform where you can uh, sell that inventory and just, just make the profit off of there, right? So, so that, that's, a, that's a mode that even, you know, as a, as a European merchant, you could go say, hey, you know, why don't we try to do it this way uh, in the future, right? And, and, and I, I see, then just giving that example, I see things like that or different, different sort of options for enabling or, 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 or playing the supply chain uh, to come up. And, and my advice would just be to keep your uh, you know, minds open to those opportunities. 
OK, great. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there for today. But thanks, gentlemen, both for your time. OK, so that's everything for Locad TV this week. We'll be back again next week with another episode. But until then, thanks for watching.